Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ask Key Anything presented by Mosher Consulting. I'm your host, Angel Leon, Mosher's HR advisor. In this week's episode, we'll be talking about a subject that should be on the top of your list if you're someone who likes to be in the cyberspace a lot, and that is cybersecurity. With us today to talk about cybersecurity is Jason Lowmiller. Jason is currently a senior security consultant for Cybersheet Services International, a cybersecurity firm in the defense supply chain industry and a former assistant professor of cybersecurity in Anderson University. He has experience working in DevOps, systems and network administration, development, and cybersecurity. Jason has also been an independent security consultant and trainer. He has a bachelor's in business information systems from Indiana Wesleyan University and a master's degree in cybersecurity from Bellevue University. Jason, it is a pleasure to have you with us in Ask you Anything to talk about such an important topic in today's world. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me on today on Hill. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with uh, your listener base on uh, all topics cyber. Well, I think this topic is is really an important one, especially because of the world we live in. We hear about some sort of cyber security attack or cyber security issue going on in the world. I feel like almost daily, right? Yeah, it's one of those uh, one of those topic areas that can really be uh, hard to stay on top of, depending upon what market vertical you kind of find yourself to be in. Uh, either uh, you know, industry cyber problems will 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 be you know, unique into their own industry. And you'll be into uh, areas where different re regulations will change dependent upon uh, what the what the business is. So for medical and uh, uh, insurance, you, you know, deal with things like uh, HIPAA and high tech. Uh, for uh, federal systems, you deal with DFARS and the uh, impending CMMC. Uh, so it's, it's a very wide field that really, really needs people that uh, understand business and also technology. Well, before we dive in into some of those topics, I'd like to start with your credentials. Uh, what could you tell us about your time in general in cybersecurity? I want to learn a little bit about your time in education as well as a professor. So, you know, my entrance into cybersecurity was not, uh, not probably very similar to anybody else that's currently looking to go into cybersecurity. Back in the mid '90s, when I was in college, uh, you know, I was going to Indiana Wesleyan for a bachelor's degree in computer information systems, and it was okay. You know, I had uh, out of high school, I had got a job as a programmer and uh, and liked programming, so I thought maybe I'd try out uh, going to a university and actually getting a, some sort of formal education. Turns out that the things I liked the most about working with computers was only kind of peripherally related to programming. I liked, I liked knowing how to program. It's always benefited me, but wasn't necessarily something that I wanted to do day in, day out. I didn't necessarily want to just sit in and, uh, you know, pump out code according to some functional requirements that were handed to me. Uh, and that kind of showed my coursework, right? I was uh, not really engaged uh, and had more fun uh, back then. Uh, you know, doing things like uh, like listening in on network connections, uh, you know, pack, capturing uh, uh, network packets as they flowed through the dormitories, stealing passwords, all the things that, you know, would kind of play out in the future of me being a cybersecurity uh, professional. But it was kind of a long, uh, long road to get there. Like back then, I didn't realize that cybersecurity was a thing or that anyone could actually uh, make money with the kind of talents or mischievousness uh, that I had been uh, kind of endowed with. So, you know, when I got out of college, or I should say I dropped out the first time, um, you know, I went and uh, went back to work, uh, went back into uh, the place I was working at in a small town doing, doing programming, doing field service work. And as a result of that, um, you know, I would get on to the certifications. I got my A plus back in uh, uh, in the you know in the '90s or in the early 2000s, and went on the certification track, and you know worked and job hopped for the next few years. Uh, you know, in the early 2000s, the dot com bubble burst, and the tech sector was kind of in a moment of upheaval. And uh, you know. Throughout that, I'd, I'd worked in uh, development, I've worked in uh, systems network administration, and always with every job that I had, there was some sort of cyber component, cybersecurity component that either the organization didn't know how to tackle or didn't want to uh, necessarily 
devote a full-time uh, employee to it because, again, it was uh, one of those kind of those peripheral job responsibilities at the moment. It wasn't really seen as being super important at the time. So those were always kind of attached to my uh, to my positions that I was uh, was going into. It wasn't until I d- decided to, uh, you know, work for uh, a- another place, Indiana Wesleyan uh, University, as a security uh, administrator, that you know that I actually went down to a formalized path of working in cybersecurity. It was always kind of peripheral. And so my credentials currently, after uh, I left Indiana Wesleyan uh, to do adjunct teaching and and to do uh, uh, my own consulting business. Uh, I was teaching certification uh, uh, platforms like ISACA's uh, CISM, their C-RISC, mm-hmm. ISC squared CISP. Uh, so I have uh, a lot of different certifications uh, right now uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, I have not maintained my CPEs as well as I probably should have. Uh, and so that's always kind of one of the challenges. You get all these different certifications and uh, they all need CPEs. Uh, and that's actually, uh, it, it, is, it, it is a good thing for the certifications to ensure that the people that are certified are maintaining their credentials. Uh, so I, that's not to me to, to, to you know, downplay or, uh, you know, not say that CPEs are important because they absolutely are. So I did a lot of consulting. I did uh, uh, incident response uh, for some clientele in the, in the Midwest here, uh, incident response training, uh, lots of just uh, consulting with nonprofits or, or other ministries when the opportunities arise. So that's, that's interesting. And I want to dive into some of the credential stuff a little bit later. I wanted just to go back to the uh, education part. So could you tell us a little bit more about the curriculum you taught and now diving a little bit deeper into that education requirement and those uh, certifications, what would you say are the major requirements needed for somebody who's looking to get into an undergrad degree or maybe just a certification in cybersecurity? So that's great. Uh, you know, I really am a fan of the CompTIA, uh, the CompTIA stack, the A plus, the Net plus, the Sec plus for uh, individuals that are looking to get into or break into cybersecurity. Um, for a while there, uh, I was running some uh, some free classes uh, for some of the CompTIA Sec plus for individuals who just wanted to uh, wet their whistle. They didn't want to pay for a full boot camp, but they wanted to see if this was something that they were interested in because. Uh, myself growing up, that would have been something I would have absolutely loved to have taken advantage of, that the opportunity to at least try something before committing to a full-on educational experience. Uh, I like a lot the CompTIA stuff for the introductory. Uh, You know, the the CISP and the CISM both have requirements of five years of experience in cybersecurity or some sort of related, uh, kind of an adjacent uh, field. As far as like talking about job skills uh, and some of the things that people kind of need uh, to have in order to be successful cyber practitioners and even going into the university. When I would teach my cyber fundamentals class, I would teach the students that uh, if you can kind of imagine a quadrant, and again, uh, you know, we're, we're in IT, we love our, our Gartner quadrants, and anybody who's in business loves a good quadrant. Uh, if you can kind of imagine a quadrant with the, uh, the, the vertical axis being between technical and non-technical, uh, or I should say the first quadrant being non-technical and the second quadrant being technical, and then the, the horizontal axis being between good and evil. Uh, we kind of need people on both sides of that technical axis, but in that good area. And, you know, different areas for me where I've been at in different times of my life, you know, I can kind of spend uh, time in, in, in either one of those quadrants. So you really have to have you really have to have cyber professionals that understand things about business, who understand things about regulation, they can read laws, but they also need to be able to be technical and understand how a network operates and what, you know, what are some of the, uh, what are some of the ways that the IPv4 uh, stack is vulnerable and, you know, how have we gotten to where we are today? So for cyber professionals, they really have to understand business. They have to understand uh, things like people process uh, data and technology, uh, but they also have to understand uh, some of the low level aspects of where technology has made us vulnerable and continues to make us vulnerable so far. So somehow during this discussion, I thought about Star Wars for some reason, because you mentioned, you know, being on the good side and the bad side. And this sounds a lot like Star Wars. You're either on the light or the dark side. Yeah. Or you either have a red saber or a blue saber, right? You either are, are uh, on that red team where you're uh, constantly attacking and very offensive, or you're on that blue team where, uh, you know, you're using the force uh, 
to uh, uh, to do what you need to do, right? So it's very interesting that you know we, <laughs> I know we're joking, but um, it's very interesting describing it this way because when you think about cybersecurity, and if you like to think of it in the way you described, you have people on one side who are trying to get into um, a system, uh, a network, um, you know, and choose, take your pick about the most recent uh, attacks that have occurred. But then on the inside, you have this defense. So it, it's kind of also, you know, to use a sports analogy, it's kind of also like a soccer field where you have the attackers and the defenders. And, you know, it, it, it's up to a lot of people which side they want to fight on, right? And, you know, you really have to play up to people's talents, too. Uh, you know, one of the things I learned that uh, in doing things like coaching uh, or instructing for the CISM, the C-RISC, uh, one of the many platforms, either from a uh, defensive practitioner basis or from a, you know, an organizational governance basis, uh, you need people on both sides of the fence and you need to be able to play to their skills. Like if, you know, you don't necessarily want the C-level uh, implementing a firewall, but you definitely want that C-level to understand what that firewall is doing and why it's there. So, and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, even going back into consulting, uh, you know, when I, when I left education, I didn't really leave education because one of the things that I get to do uh, when I'm working with clients is to educate them on uh, what these regulations mean or what this device is, is intended for. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. You you have to uh, you have to both use and play to people's strengths on the team and uh, uh, kind of get everyone to the same level, even though they may have different functions. And speaking of that, playing to people's skills, um, I feel like the defenders, if you will, right, the the people that are inside your organization trying to defend against cyber attacks, they have to know from both sides of the court because. In a cybersecurity environment, just like in any security environment, you have to be able to detect attacks. You have to be able to detect anything that might be coming. So you have to prepare for that. So how do you prepare for a cyber attack if you're on the defensive side? You know, on the defensive side, you know, and as can, in the consulting world, I've, I've been a huge fan of the NIST CSF framework. And this NIST CSF framework, one of the, it breaks down things into five important phrases, phases. Uh, and the first phase is to identify. You have to identify all your systems. You have to identify who your threats are. Uh, and you have to identify you know, where your informational flows are going in, within your organization to external organization. Uh, and if you can't do the identify phase well, then you literally have uh, very little chance on picking up on any sort of attack that's currently impending. So, you know, you have to be tied into things like uh, like threat awareness, like threat awareness streams. You have to be tied into uh, what the uh, what the current uh, playbook looks like for a threat, uh, how they're going to uh, try to gain access to what they want to gain access to, uh, and that's one of the things that uh, you know. Talking about different regulations, uh, working in the current uh, defense industrial base, you know, we're looking at the DFARS. Uh, uh, regulations with the CMMC coming up. And the reason for this is because our supply chain has been being picked apart. Uh, no longer is it important for, uh, for a threat to be able to rip off, uh, rip off data uh, for some confidential piece of information. They can go ahead and aggregate all that confidential data by picking apart all the unclassified data that all the suppliers in that supply chain have. So, you know, and, and it's simply understanding how the threats are currently uh, currently trying to gain access to the information they're trying to gain access to. How are they trying to win? Interesting, interesting perspective. See, I, 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 I go back to that uh, thought that I had initially about defenders having to know offensive skills too, yep. because, you know, in that, as you mentioned, in that detection stage, so they have to do that. So they have to run their own simulations. They have to run their own, uh, you know, attacks, if you will, sort of like you would do on a, on a physical security where you do a simulation of a fire, say, and so then you bring out the people and you put them in the, in the safe space that your organization has decided. So I view the defenders, um, it, I, I put them in a high platform, if you will, because they are the ones that have to have that knowledge 
from both the offensive and defensive skills to make sure that your organization is safe. Yep, and it constantly changes. The you know the, the vulnerabilities that systems might be subject to uh, today uh, change how the uh, threats will adjust their playbooks in the future. So you constantly have it's a constant cat and mouse game where we're trying to identify you know what is vulnerable, how could a threat possibly leverage this against us, uh, and you know but it really starts with first understanding what assets you have the threat could leverage a vulnerability on to gain access to the stuff that they're trying to want to get access to. Right. The playbook is constantly changing. I, constantly I, changing. Okay. So I have to ask uh, a little bit to go back to the, to the whole uh, education side of it, of things. Uh, do you have any stories about your students and their prospects in the field of cybersecurity? What could you tell us about that? So, you know, a lot of my students, uh, whether it's been through uh, community colleges or it's been through, uh, more formal education like at Anderson, and Anderson has a great program. That's a, it's a great university if you're wanting to uh, wanting to get exposed into cyber or wanting to work on the uh, national security policy side of things. Anderson University is definitely the place to do it at. Uh, President John Pistol uh, and his contacts and uh, some of the other uh, professors in there, uh, Dr. Michael Frank, uh, they're all top-notch professors who have a lot of uh, great contacts in the national security. Uh, and uh, they really uh, let students uh, have a lot of good exposure into uh, some organizations or some uh, uh, groups uh, that uh, a lot of other universities wouldn't necessarily be able to get them exposed to. So, you know, that's a, that's a great place to start uh, as far as an education perspective goes. Uh, my students, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, through, through our formalized classes or informal classes, uh, you know, they have all uh, gone into uh, doing cyber for, uh, you know, other organizations uh, quite effectively. And, you know, the job market right now for people uh, doing cybersecurity is pretty rich, uh, you know, whether they're doing uh, risk assessments or whether they're doing vulnerability analysis or, or whether they're, uh, uh, you know, just uh, doing systems and network administration with a little bit of uh, uh, cyber defense added in. There's a lot of different areas and ways you can take a cyber career, whether it's uh, governance, risk, and compliance, uh, or whether it's uh, going down the uh, more technical track of being a uh, bug bounty hunter. Uh, I've had students that have gone down both tracks. And again, it kind of, you have to identify what your student is more geared to uh, and kind of pointing them to, uh, to those different jobs and uh, and helping them to uh, grow. Well, I have two thoughts on that. I have to second your thoughts on Mr. Pistol. I may or may not have met Mr. Pistol in a previous uh, working life where he and I worked in the same area. Um, so he is a gentleman's gentleman. Um, yes. He is phenomenal and cybersecurity and national security are his areas of expertise. Having said that, I have to ask, bug hunting? Yeah, so, you know, one of the interesting things uh, is that uh, uh, that we've seen over the past, I don't know, 10 years or, or so now, uh, is that uh, the, the market, uh, like the free market has, uh, has found a niche in bug bounty hunting where organizations will uh, throw out bug bounties uh, for people that uh, if they want to try to find a bug in a software, or some sort of vulnerability uh, that they will then provide the uh, person who reports that bug uh, or reports that vulnerability then to that organization, uh, and then they'll get a reward. Uh, there have been some people out there who are just incredibly smart. Uh, they've made millions uh, of, of money, uh, you know, millions of dollars just just doing bug bug hunting, uh, and they've had you know little or few formal education. And when I'm talking about like the quadrant, you know, these are the people in that very far right end of the quadrant that are just incredibly technical. They're the MIT dropouts, right? They're the people that are uh, almost too smart for their own good. Uh, that you know haven't really gone through that formal education. There's not a lot of those, right? I mean, making money in bug bounties not necessarily for everybody, uh, but it's definitely out there. It's uh, another uh, interesting uh, a career path for for certain people. Another Star Wars reference: bounty yeah. hunting. It's yeah. uh, <laughs> we're yeah. full of those today. Uh, so sh <laughs> shifting the gears. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shifting gears a little bit now to the corporate world, um, what do you think are the top issues in cybersecurity facing small and medium-sized companies, and how 
can we address those? How, how can we attack uh, those issues? Well, 99.9% of business uh, in the United States is small business. Uh, and, you know, with small businesses, you don't have the, the luxury of having lots of, uh, of wiggle room to identify, uh, you know, what products could possibly help reduce your risk or, you know, what, uh, what things you should have, what kind of controls you should have in place in order to uh, into, in order to mitigate uh, the, the, the risks that your organization has. I think a lot of it also has to do with awareness. Uh, we see uh, small businesses see, you know, 99.9% .9 again is a uh, small business. And when we're talking about cybersecurity, we see all these controls, all these technical controls to address risk uh, and, and they're not cheap, right? Mm -hmm. So you have these small mom and pops who, uh, might be subject to attacks from China because they may or may not have, uh, you know, uh, controlled and classified information that they're working with. You know, they might be something like a, uh, a machine shop and they're making parts for, for Boeing. Um, and, and it's unfortunately, uh, those organizations are the kind of targets that, that uh, the foreign adversaries are trying to get access to that information, get access to that data. And there's not a whole lot that they, you know, can can do outside of what they're already doing, or they may feel that way, because uh, there's there's just so much there. There's so much to cybersecurity, and you know, you have out there people that are selling uh, fear, unbelief, and doubt. They sell uh, snake oil. They sell the next biggest thing, uh, you know, and and so you have a lot of small mom and pops that don't know how to necessarily apply what is necessary to help protect them. So all that to say, um, you know, there's a great guide uh, on the NIST, uh, NIST.gov page uh, for small business uh, that, that I've used in some of my classes to help uh, helps explain cybersecurity, helps explain things like controls, like threats uh, to small businesses. And I think uh, I think now, uh, you know, fast forward uh, the many years that it's taken from where I've started in cybersecurity to where we are now. Uh, and I think businesses are starting to understand it a little bit better, right? We have a lot more uh, reporting on it. We're much more aware, like the situational awareness uh, across the United States has, has grown to where we see that what this problem is. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of small businesses that might not necessarily know, uh, you know, what are the things that we can do to help protect ourselves, and again, it goes back into that education, uh, you know, that education aspect where we're trying to educate uh, or need to educate small businesses on, you know, what some of the risks are and how they can uh, implement certain things to help reduce that risk. And I agree. I feel like cybersecurity and all the risks associated with that are being widely reported nowadays. Of course, you hear about larger instances where you know, larger companies, larger organizations get attacked. And so it, it immediately blows out. Somebody's, uh, you know, pointing the finger at XYZ country at XYZ, you know, place. And so, but what we don't hear is, like you mentioned, those small and medium sized shops that may or may not be, are, are being currently attacked. And like you said, maybe they're a contractor for XYZ company and they're building a part that, helps that bigger size company. So then you've got foreign adversaries, foreign companies coming in and basically just taking those little bits and pieces away from that mom and pop shop and then just basically turning that into their own product and then maybe just pushing it out to the market so that they can sell their own product instead of having a local shop here in America do that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for a lot of the smaller organizations too, it's just simply having that awareness, right? They may not be even aware that they've been compromised. They may not be aware that there's anything even to respond to. Uh, with things like ransomware, it's a little bit more obvious because, you know, you can't get access to the files that you're trying to get access to. Uh, but for others, uh, you know, you might have uh, someone within your systems, they might've been there for a while and you never know about it. So, uh, you know, having those controls in place to have the right visibility uh, to, uh, to your network, to your uh, systems, absolutely critical, even for small organizations, uh, so that they, uh, so that they understand what is going on and what needs to be responded to. 
Uh, and it doesn't take a lot of money to do it, uh, but it does take understanding what the right controls are in order to have the visibility. Well, and it also doesn't take a lot to be to be under attack because I mean something as simple as an email where you click a link that basically opens up the floodgates, right? Yep, absolutely, absolutely, and, and that awareness that uh, of, of what the threat is doing. Like here, here is a common play that they are constantly doing, you know, and that's uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit easier to to, to track with things like. Uh, with email, uh, but then uh, the play might change ever so slightly, and now it's uh, now it's a whole lot more complicated than it was. Yeah, I mentioned email because I feel like that's basically kind of like the entry, you know, kind of like them knocking on the door. Hey, I'm here, and I'm I'm Joe. I'm in my in my steel company, and I'm and I'm you know building this little tiny part made of steel for Boeing, like you mentioned, yep. but you know, Matt sends me this email and I'm thinking it's Matt, my buddy, and I click this link and it takes me to this nice little YouTube video. And then all of a sudden, everything in my computer gets downloaded somewhere around the globe. Yeah. Yep. So that, that that's why that's why I mentioned email because it's like it's like a gateway. But then, as you mentioned, there's there's more that can be happening. The attacks change, the, the playbook changes, even for the bad guys, too. Yep, even for the bad guys and the players also change. Uh, you'll see different advanced persistent threats in one threat group uh, being more prolific at times than the other. Uh, and, uh, you know, it just, it just depends. Like those threats constantly change. They're usually after similar things, uh, but uh, uh, what and how they do it and who is doing it also does change too. Unbelievable. A lot of stuff that we have to be aware of. Well, uh, Jason, before we let you go, I, I do want to ask you three questions that we ask all of our guests just to get them uh, to give us their thoughts on these things. So uh, what's a commonly held belief about cybersecurity that you passionately disagree with? One of the things that I disagree with uh, and, and it's commonly held belief, and I dealt with this with many clients is that cybersecurity is seen as being the office of no, uh, or the, the department of no, where, you know, we're, we're not going to let you uh, do your thing that you're wanting to do, we're going to tell you, no, you can't do it. Um, and so I, I dealt with that a lot uh, in, uh, in a lot of different areas where I've, uh, where I've worked. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully, if you're a cyber practitioner listening to this, hopefully, uh, you know, our, our responsibility as cyber practitioners is to uh, ensure that the organization can get done what they need to do. And if we are in getting that in the way of that, uh, then we are also then a liability in that in terms of, uh, you know, we're talking about CIA or the CIA triad and cybersecurity, that availability, we're stopping the organization from doing what they need to be able to do. So we need to be there and coming alongside people uh, and telling them, you know, how they can do things safely. And if, and if there is a unsafe practice that the business absolutely has to do, uh, then we help them put in other compensating controls and helping them do it well. Uh, or do it at least in the most safely, safe manner that they possibly can do it. So, you know, often people would see me come in as a, as a cyber professional and they would kind of roll their eyes and be like, oh no, here's this guy coming to tell me that I can't do my job. Uh, and that's absolutely, uh, absolutely not the role that I want uh, people to see me in. I want them to see me as an enabler that helps them to be able to get done what they need to do, but also to enable the organization to do it in the most safe manner possible. Uh, taking those processes and making them safe. I mean, I, I don't see what's the wrong thing about that. So next question, what's something that everyone in your industry space should start or stop doing? You know, that's a tough question. What should we stop or start doing? I think if you look at some of the reports uh, that have come out uh, that, you know, what what are the things that, that cybersecurity practitioners need to be able to do? Like, what, like I, ISC squared puts forth this report every year on the uh, on the workforce, and they have this thing called the technical skills gap, or the skills gap in the cyber workforce. Uh, everyone wants to focus on the technical because, as uh, you know, as people, it's easier to put in technical controls than it is to change people's behavior, right? So I think that we need to stop necessarily working and, and working everything as a technical control, uh, and start understanding that you know, in that uh, workforce study. Uh, we have to be better communicators. We have to work on our communication skills. And I think we have to stop expecting people to uh, be at our level in order to uh, talk to them about cybersecurity. Uh, and we have to you know, bring it to them if, if at all possible. We have to bring it down to 
uh, levels that they're currently at and things that they can understand. Last question. When you first started in cybersecurity, what was harder than you expected? You know, I think the thing that was the most difficult for me starting in cybersecurity was getting others to understand that the importance of it. Uh, you know, when I started back in the early 2000s uh, with, with uh, security, uh, was getting people to understand that, hey, you know, just because we are choosing this design pattern or this method of deployment, uh, that we should be revisiting this to make sure that there's no other ways that this could be, you know, used against us, or there's no other ways that someone else could use this in any other manner. So I think, you know, just early on, it was striving and driving for people to take it seriously. And I think that is, you know, you see that obviously in, uh, in you know, how we are today and, and how we've gotten to where we are. Uh, and, you know, even, even in just trying to do our own jobs, you know, getting, getting, uh, getting education out there, getting people to take it seriously and, and uh, not, uh, not take it for granted. And I would see where that, you know, skepticism might come back in the early 2000s because we just had the whole Y2K thing and, you know, with the internet and people not really realizing what we had in our hands with the internet, because back then the internet was accessible, but we didn't have the devices, the type of technology that we have 21 years later. Yeah. And back then it didn't absolutely morph uh, some of our supply chains, morph uh, how we do business, uh, you know, morph our economy to where it is today. Uh, so back then we saw it largely as a novelty uh, and today, it's absolutely a critical resource that we rely on, that the hospitals rely on, that uh, the, the banks rely on. Uh, and so it's uh, kind of been one of those things where we're on a little bit of a house of sand a little bit. Uh, we're getting better every year uh, at different, uh, uh, you know, and, and kind of bolting on new controls to compensate for other weaknesses. Uh, but it's still a bit of a cat and mouse game. Yeah, it is. I agree. Jason, this has been a great conversation to have on cybersecurity. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Look forward to talking to you again. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening in to this week's edition of ASCII Anything presented by Mojo Consulting. We hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation about cybersecurity with our guest, Jason Miller. Join us next week when we continue to dive deeper with our resident experts and what they're currently working on. If you have an idea or a topic you'd like us to explore, please reach out to us through our social media channels. In the meantime, please remember to give us a rating and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcast. Until then, stay safe in the cyberspace, and so long, everybody. Bye.